So we are in the conversation about systemic racism. This is an age old conversation. We've been doing this conversation for many, many years, for decades, for centuries even. And the truth of the matter is, if we're questioning if systemic racism exists, you're asking the wrong question. It's asking like, is the sky blue? You know, does water quench first? Yes, it exists. Yes, it's baked into our society. Yes, it is a, a sin that is in the soil and embedded in our everyday life. And yes, it is something that we as a church and as a people and as a generation need to combat, call out and push against. Um, when George Floyd uh, was murdered um, and executed on live TV for all of us to see, um, when you know the stuff about COVID becomes more and more pronounced in our lives in terms of it uh, affecting people from uh, the most uh, unprivileged backgrounds, when we can be shot in the back for taking a jog, uh, when we see over and over again people that look like me um, having uh, pipelines into prison and being uh, you know told that they can't go further or faster than they should be able to go just based on the color of their skin um, it is a failure to humankind and it is not right and it is something that we need to push against now it's easy to say something that we need to push against and when all this was happening I was really um, almost disoriented really because it was like oh here we go again it's happening again what do we do the hashtags are happening again you know the twitter feeds are happening again uh, people are talking online again about all this stuff and people are pulling on me saying Seth what do you want to say about this how do you respond uh, what's your take on xyz um, and you know what to be honest I I just felt a bit bit bewildered really because we seeing George Floyd uh, you know saying I can't breathe uh, we all felt that. We all felt that that was us. We all saw ourselves in him. Um, uh, and people were asking us to comment on the pain while we were still in pain. He was asking us to comment on our bleeding while we're still bleeding. Um, asking us to analyze what's going on whilst we're still bleeding profusely in public for everyone to see. And, and uh, maybe it was, you know, this unique cocktail of us being at home, locked in our houses, not being forced not to uh, be distracted by anything else, not being able to go on our commute to work, not being able to, you know, go to church and play a tambourine and have a good old hallelujah time. Maybe it was the fact that we had to focus our attention on this injustice, why we decided to go beyond the hashtag. It felt like this moment became more than a hashtag. It felt like this moment became a movement that the needle was going to finally bend further towards justice. And I've got this mantra, as you probably know if you follow me on social media, after all is said and done, don't let more be said than done. And my God, we can do that. We can drown in the discussions. We can drown in the conversations. We can have debates after debates and panel sessions after panel sessions and commissions after commissions and nothing changes. After all is said and done, don't let more be said than done. And so I've been pondering for a couple of you know moments and uh, speaking to some friends and uh, working uh, across the many spaces that I get to occupy from tear funds to symphony to worship to you know working with church leaders or in the community and um, I've got three things that I want to challenge us as a people as a generation as a church to move into uh, for us so that for us to drive this agenda beyond a hashtag number one equity we need to have a conversation about equity True equality, this illusion of this word that we seem to be seeking out its real meaning cannot be unpacked unless we have a conversation about equity. Because the truth of the matter is, as beautiful as we all are, we are all not the same. And we are all not starting from the same starting lines. You've got enough stats, statistics, uh, uh, all on Google for you to find out where the disproportionate uh, stuff is, where the dis disparities are. We are not all starting from the same starting lines. And so I challenge institutions, charities, organizations, churches, establishments um, that have got roots in the ground, roots in the soil, um, whose structures stand on the shoulders of those that have been disenfranchised for years. Uh, those, you know, those people that, that have uh, 
uh, gone before us, I challenge you to move from apology to allyship. So put your money where your mouth is, invest in black spaces, invest in marginalized movements so that you can bridge the gap between those that want to and those that can. Number two is education. My mom used to ingrain in me as we were walking to school back uh, in my secondary school years that education will get you economic emancipation. It is the means to economic emancipation. It means that education will give you the keys so that you can get in the door and sit at the table. If they don't want you to sit at the table and you know who they is, you can create your own table. Um, the problem uh, in our society, as we saw in Theresa May's disparity report, is we live in a country where the type of education, the quality of education you will and will not receive is based on the postcode that you are from. Far too many times we see our black boys, um, not, so not so much our black girls because they're killing it in the game right now, but our black boys are really struggling in terms of getting their attainment in regards to their GCSEs. Fewer and fewer black boys are leaving secondary school with five, just five GCSEs. And we all know that good GCSEs will get you into a good college or sixth form, which will then get you into a good university, which can eventually set you up for life. We need to do more as a people uh, to help our young people, our young black boys get better education so that they can become all that God's called them to be. Um, and we need to have a full 360 degree view on education in regards to knowing who we are as a people. And we can't say black lives matter and only think about black Western privileged lives. Black lives matter and that means all black lives. That's the black lives in care, that's the black lives in prison, that's black lives from the LGBT community, that's black lives that are disabled, that's black lives that are, are, are on, on not even ships but are trying to flee war-torn countries to come into this kind of spaces. Every single black life matters and as children of God we need to show them that through our word and through our deeds. Education is the key, education is the door. We need to do better in our education. Number three is emancipation. The Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He also says that he, God, is seeking those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, the scripture says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom, emancipation. And oftentimes uh, we go into corporate spaces, into church settings, we listen to certain music, we see how other people do it and we pander to the dominant culture or the dominant way of doing things. And we let ourselves go and try and do things the way that other people will deem as the opiate of worship. Where God is calling you to worship him in spirit and in truth. There is such freedom, such richness, such beauty, such diversity when you bring to him your all. And I want to see, I want to challenge the church to go beyond listening and writing and hearing songs from people that are just male and, and, and pale, <laughs> like, you know, as much as I love them dearly. What would it sound like if a, if, a, if a migrant wrote a worship song or someone that just fled captivity wrote a worship song? What does it sound like for, uh, for brothers from the island? or from you know the village to write worship songs to the Lord what does it sound for what does it sound like for women to write worship songs to the Lord why are we not singing the songs of his people and so I want to call everyone to go beyond you know uh, pandering to that space but really embracing the multicultural uh, worship that God calls us to give him you know, I think about some of the songs my grandma used to sing or some of the songs that my mom used to sing um, and as uh, simple and as effortless as they were, um, wrapped in their hallelujah, wrapped in their thank you Jesus, uh, wrapped in their response, the way that they worship, their exuberance, their praise, uh, it, it, it was a place of release, it was a place of passion, it was a place of therapy. I don't want you to lose who you are, bring all that you are into worship because God has created you just as you are. So equity, education and emancipation let's drive those three things and let's see a better world let's keep the conversation going